Greetings, brethren, from the Seventh-day Adventist Church and Davidian Seventh-day Adventist. Welcome to our presentation, where today we will discuss the Elijah message. And who is it that is to come in the spirit power of Elijah? This is a question that is creates a lot of controversy, depending on which circle you're in. We want to look at the issue of can messengers be sent without a message? Next, how many Latter-day Elijahs are there? It turns out, if one is wide awake, you'll recognize that there are several competing individuals claiming to be Elijahs. Who's right and who's wrong? Also, is Ellen White a fulfillment of the prophecy in Malachi 4.5 to come in the spirit power of Elijah? Or is this a fable? And finally, who will give the Elijah message in the latter days? So these are the questions we want to address in our presentation. So let us begin with this text for meditation. It's really the central reference in the spirit of prophecy is often misunderstood and misinterpreted. It comes from Testimonies to Ministers, page 475, and we're reading from the 1962 edition. It reads, Prophecy must be fulfilled. The Lord says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Somebody is to come in the spirit and power of Elijah. And when he appears, men may say, You are too earnest. You do not interpret the scriptures in the proper way. Let me tell you how to teach your message. Well, notice the in red there, the appendix item. And we're going to look at that in detail. This was added um, long after Ellen White passed away. So we want to see uh, and come and understand what who's this Elijah to come? Because this is where there uh, there's so much confusion and controversy. So let's first look at this appendix and note carefully that it was added in 1962. Ellen White died in 1915. So we're going to read it. It's in capital letters. And the importance of this is when editors of the White Estate added words to Ellen White, they put it in capital to signify clearly that this was the writing of people not Ellen White herself. So these are people that added things to her uh, message in the appendix. And we're going to read through this. It's a little long, but to show you how these men, these leaders, are misinterpreting Ellen White's writings. So let us read here. This is a comment or an appendix item regarding the passage on page 475, which we just read. Somebody's the common spirit power of Elijah. These words have been mistakenly applied to some to some individual who it was thought would appear with a prophetic message subsequent or after to Mrs. Wife's life and work. The three paragraphs compromising this article titled Let Heaven Guide are only a small portion of a talk given by Ellen White in Battle Creek, Michigan, in the morning of January 29, 1890, as this was published in the Review and Herald of February 18, 1890, it carried the title of How to Meet a Controverted Point of Doctrine. Other excerpts drawn from this article and used largely to fill out certain pages of this volume, volume may be found on pages 23, 104, 111, 119, 158, 278, and 368. The article has been reproduced in its entirety in Selected Messages, Book 1, pages 406 to 416, with the portion comprising the ex excerpt entitled Let Heaven Guide appearing on pages 413, or 412 and 413. When the article is read in its entirety, it becomes apparent that Ellen White, in the statement made just a little more than a year after the Minneapolis conference to a group of in Battle Creek, was speaking of her own ministry. Some had grown critical of her work. Note that in the paragraph preceding that which appears in this volume on page 475, Ellen White states, 
and we continue on, we should come into a position where every difference will be melted away. If I think I have light, I shall do my duty by in presenting it. Suppose I consulted others concerning the message the Lord would have me to give to the people. The door might be closed so that the light might not reach the ones to whom God had sent it. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed be the King that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I will them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. The Jews tried to stop the proclamation of the message that had been predicted in the word of God. Then she makes reference again to her own experience. Prophecy must be fulfilled. The Lord says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great dreadful day of the Lord. Malachi 4, 5. Somebody is to come in the spirit power of Elijah, and when he appears, men may say, You're too earnest. You do not interpret the scriptures in the proper way. Selected Messages, Book 1, page 412. That she was referring to her own experience is also made clear from the paragraph which follows, in which she declares, I shall tell the truth as God gives it to me. End of appendix item. Now, friends, this is pure witchcraft. This is sophistry. A lot of words attempting to twist the plainest meaning of Ellen White when she refers to somebody to come in the spirit and power of Elijah, and when he, as in a singular masculine pronoun, comes, she's referring to her work. Well, Ellen White was not transgender. Ellen White was a female. So whoever this he is, it can't be Ellen White, if you just take the plain reading of the English language. However, these scholars or leading men are attempting to divert Seventh-day Adventist away from the realization that somebody is indeed to come after her to proclaim a message announcing the great and dreadful day of the Lord. But they want you to ignore that and believe that it's Ellen White talking about herself but it's sheerly illogical based on the plain reading of her text. So why did they do this? Well, they did it to divert the idea that a message is going to come after Ellen White, announcing judgment for the living, the great dreadful day of the Lord. And this diversion continues on in the adult Sabbath school lesson from the second quarter, 2019. This is just recent. And they're talking about the Elijah message. This is what it reads. It says, in a sense, we as evidence see ourselves in the role of John the Baptist. The herald of reform and repentance sought to prepare the way for the first coming of Jesus. We as a movement see ourselves doing the same for the second coming. So they're painting this picture in the, in the minds of some of the Adventists that they, all some of the Adventists at a movement, are indeed bringing this message the Elijah message. However, how can you bear a message without being sent? What is the message? It has to be brought by a messenger. It's not the message that arose from 1844 declaring the judgment for the dead, but it has to be some additional light on the judgment for the living. But the Sabbath school lesson is calculated to divert people from the idea that there's another message to come. So this work of deception is widespread. What we find is that prior additions to the Testimonies to Ministers that were published first in 1922 and later in 1944 had no appendix. Okay. That's interesting. So why did they add it in 1962? Well, it church, turns out church leaders have gone to almost superhuman efforts to deceive the lay people, that is, the common Seventh-day Adventists, against investigating the claims of the shepherd's rod message since its beginning. That's what they were trying to do. The shepherd's rod message came in 1930, and it proclaimed very clearly and distinctly the great and dreadful day of the Lord, the soon coming judgment for the living that would first begin in the house of God and manifest in the purification event known as Ezekiel 9. But the church leaders don't want people to look at that. 
So we see that the adult Sabbath school quarterly is used today as an instrument to divert people from the realization that there is to be a messenger to come, and it will be a singular person, a male in figure. And indeed, the author of the Shepherd's Rod was a male. His name was Victor Tasho Houtov. So, if we were to gather some copies of Testimonies to Ministers, here's four copies. Which one's reliable? Well, it turns out of this set of four, only the one on the left, the red one, it was a 1944 edition, is reliable. The other editions here, published at different times, were all published after 1962, and they include the appendix item, the diversion from the plain reading of the original editions. So, let's stick with the original edition and void these fables of men. And if you go into the white estate in the archives of the General Conference, you can find these type of documents. It, uh, if you go to Andrews University, for example, the Center of Adventist Research, they have a file, um, question and answer file, regarding this statement in page uh, on Testimonies to Ministers, page 475. And of course, at the time, this was, here's a letter written in April 18, 1957, by Arthur White. Turns out the grandson of Ellen White, he was the secretary or head of the White Estate Publications. And he's responding to a pastor, Lowellian Jones, in Australia, explaining to him, uh, the pastor wrote in, inquiring about TM 475. And Arthur White comes back and says, well, uh, D. E. Elder D. E. Robinson uh, wrote an article on this subject showing that it's not somebody to come after well and white, not a man, uh, uh, not Victor Haddoff, not the Shepherd's Rod, but Ellen White was talking about her own work. So here's this work of deception, and, and it continues on. Here's another letter in the same year, 1957, written to a pastor, Linde Laws, also from Australia, going on once again to explain and try to reinterpret the plain reading of the Spirit of Prophecy, Ellen White's writings, to make her appear as if she's transgender, that a he is really a she. It's, it's a totally illogical. So this work all comes from the pseudo-scholarship of an elder D.E. Robinson who wrote this little pamphlet called The Elijah Prophecy. Must it be fulfilled by an individual? And he twists it around that the Eliza message is doesn't come from a single individual, but it's a whole group of people. You know, the whole church is proclaiming the, the, the Elijah message. The only problem with this is, what's the message there to bear? Never clarifies that. So it's a scholarly attempt to uh, spin doctor and come up with a cunningly devised fable to mislead Seventh-day Adventists from reading and examining the claims of the shepherd's rod. So how do we detect a counterfeit? Well, it turns out that today in Seventh-day Adventism, there are a number of ministries that claim to have the Elijah message. However, there's one thing we can recognize to detect if they're, not, if they're true or not. One, they do not clearly explain the great and dreadful day of the Lord. What is it? Okay. And two... These ministries introduce heterodox, that means contrary to basic Seventh-day Adventist doctrine, and imply that they are the Elijah message. For example, at the anti-Trinitarian controversy, or the 2520-day uh, prophecy group. Okay, these are offshoot ministries that are active in the church, that believe that they have the Elijah message. However, if careful examination, they fail to study and prove the true Elijah message for themselves. So people are easy, easily misled because they don't know what the true is. They don't study for themselves. So who are these counterfeit Elijah messengers? Well, uh, the man on the left, Nadur Mansour, is an advocate for anti-Trinitarian doctrine, claiming that the Seventh-day Adventist teaching of a three-person Godhead is a counterfeit gospel. Um, so, 
turns out this is false, Ellen White herself clearly recognized a three-person Godhead and taught it, but they claim that Jesuits came in and changed the writings. This is patently false, and it's been well proven by articles and documentation from the White Estate. The man in the middle, Jeff Pippinger, is a prominent teacher of the 23 or the 2520 year prophecy, which is uh, was re refuted by Uriah Smith and James White themselves and many others, but he's got quite a following. And people, I think his followers, think he's some kind of Elijah message, but he's not. He does not clearly explain what the great and dreadful day of the Lord, Lord is. And even Walter Weiss, a very popular conservative Adventist minister with a large ministry and following, uh, implies in some of his videos that he has the Elijah message. It's kind of indirect, but it turns out, sorry, Walter, but you are not the Elijah messenger because you're not announcing the great and dreadful day of the Lord. You can't explain it. You, you, you bypass it. Well, let's look at some statements from the Shepherd's Rod. General Conference Special. This track, um, here's a cover of it, is the one that clearly explains how to identify the Elijah message by knowing what the great and dreadful day of the Lord is. So let's read a couple passages. In, light, in the light which this prophecy sheds, that's Malachi 4.5, on the subject, no one can possibly escape the conclusion that a prophet, a person, is to be sent before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And, the, and thus only can there be a group of people in connection with Elijah's message. So before a group of people can proclaim a message, they have to have a messenger to bring it to them. In the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, Seventh-day Adventists think this is the visible second advent. It is not at all. It's the coming of an event prior to the second advent. It's the coming of the Lord to purify the church as manifest in Ezekiel chapter 9. Let's look at this passage from the same track. If you don't have a copy, uh, in the description box below or at the end of this video, we have email, telephone, or a website. Please visit it. We'll be happy to provide you with a copy for your own investigation. This comes from page 31, it reads. It's showing the logic that the message has to come from one messenger, not a multitude of ministers. It reads, John the Baptist's statement that he himself was not the Elijah, and Jesus' statement that John was the Elijah of that day, not of our day, clear three points. One, that John was not in any sense of the word fulfilling the mission of Elijah, who is to come before the great dreadful day of the Lord, but that he, as the last prophet to the church of his day, simply came in the spirit and power of Elijah to prepare the way for the Lord's first advent. So it is that the Elijah of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, the last prophet to the church of this day, comes in the same spirit and power to prepare the way for the Lord's second advent. Point two, that as John was the Elijah of his day, yet not the Elijah the Tishbite himself, then the promise of the prophet Elijah is not necessarily to be fulfilled in person by the ancient prophet himself. And three, that as the Elijah of Christ's first advent was one person, and also as the Elijah of Mount Carmel of old was one person, not a multitude of priests, then by parity of reasoning, the Elijah of today must also be one person, not a multitude of ministers. This is clear-cut Bible logic. So there must be somebody come in the spirit power of Elijah, heralding the soon coming great and dreadful day of the Lord in the latter days to prepare God's people, the Sunday Adventist Church, for the Lord's second advent. So there's a variety of ways that you can find this. There's a website, shepherdsrodspeaks.org, uh, the Facebook Messenger, WhatsApp, YouTube videos, blog posts, websites. So there's a variety of medias that you can find all out, all about this message, the Elijah message, and the messengers. Even Zoom meetings now, since the COVID crisis. However, Davidians, 
who accept that the message came through the rages of the shepherd's rod are themselves often confused because Victor had have died in 1955 and they're fooled by counterfeit Elijah messengers. Many believe that because Elijah the prophet never died, that is Elijah the Tish, Tish, Tishbite, then Brother Hadaf would never die. However, so this opened the door for a false prophet named Ben Roden to rise up and seize the opportunity and proclaim that he was Elijah the prophet that would never die. Well, it turns out that he died in 1978, so that proves he was a false prophet. But he started the counterfeit branch Davidian movement that later became infamous in the 1993 burnout involving David Koresh. And there are many factions of this group, but they're all counterfeit of the original Shepherd's Rod. What Davidians failed to realize at the death of Brother Hadoff, only a few otherwise recognized that Elijah, the Tishbite, was a type of the 144,000 who would never die. Not a single person. Key point. So this showed you that many Davidians, although they professed to follow the message, did not read and study it carefully for themselves and were easily fooled by false prophets that arose. And we were warned about those. The Shepherd's Rod has plenty of warnings about usurpers and office seekers. Ben Roden was just one of many. And in the Shepherd's Rod, it warns us about an attempted knockout blow that would occur after 1955. And it comes from the track called White House Recruiter, page 33. It reads, Everything that can be done against God's message of today will be done with even greater vengeance than was manifest against heaven's message in the days of Christ's first advent. For the devil knows that if he loses now, he loses forever, that he is to have no other chance. Unparalleled, therefore, is the urgency that every 11th hour church member now quickly and solidly brace himself against the enemy's effort to deliver a knockout blow. We must be alert, too, to realize that the blow is to come from surprisingly unsuspected foes, from professed friends of the gospel, who are no less pious than were the priests in Christ's day. Well, this passage was written by Victor Haddaf in 1951. I believe firmly that he knew and recognized that some people that would fulfill this. He couldn't call them out by name because nobody would believe it at that time. But later, after his death, Davidians that were wide awake recognized some of the uh, professed friends who would be used by the devil to, in an attempt to destroy or knock out the message. And here are some of them. These are usurpers or false prophets and teachers that arose after the death of Brother Haddaf. Up on the upper left, that's Ben Roden, originator of the counterfeit branch message. And he died in 1978, and he handed over the office to his wife, Lois Roden, who's below him on the left. And she continued in the prophetic office as a false prophet and introduced many strange doctrines, including the radical idea, it's actually pure Gnostic belief, that the Holy Spirit is feminine. The woman on the upper right, Florence Howdoff, the wife of Brother Howdoff, was also uh, one who usurped control of the organization and introduced many false teachings, such as the unauthorized new codes and the idea that the 42 months in Revelation 11 would be fulfilled in uh, the spring of 1959. Of course, this was a false time-setting prophecy and proof that Florence Howdoff was a false teacher not the original Shepherd's Run. And then below her is M.J. Bingham, a editor under Brother Haddaf, who stepped in and inserted himself as the editor, publisher, and pronounced that he was the Porter president and a manifestation of the living spirit of prophecy. These are all false ideas and contrary to the original Shepherd's Rod, but these are some of these professed friends of the faith who arose after Victor Haddaf died and introduced heterodox or false doctrines in the name of the rod, but actually are counterfeiters. Today, there are many false Elijah prophets. These people are living. For example, the men on the left, Derek West, who broke away from Bingham's Bashan Hill and claims that he is a anatypical King David and a Elijah prophet messenger today. Utterly false. 
the man in the middle is a successor of the branch rodents branch his name is trent wildey he's a false prophet that resides in canada over on the right we have a man named lennox sam who broke away from the a group of davidians in waco texas and thinks that he is the antitypical king david and the one shepherd that's going to guide god's people to the end all counterfeits rival elijah messengers who are a counterfeit of the original and the only true elijah messenger which is victor howdo so yes we have to battle these winds of doctrine in these false prophets and teachers and the only way you're going to do that is to read and study the original shepherd's rod for yourself and pray that the holy spirit will guide lead and direct you into all truth and void the many usurpers and false prophets that have risen in our midst so what's the uh, summary for our study today well tm or testimonies to ministers 475 a simple paragraph that's so misunderstood is referring to someone a male to come in the spirit power of Elijah. This was fulfilled in the ministry of Victor Haddiff from 1930 to 1955. The rod message itself warns of usurpers to arise, and many have indeed risen since 1955. Some have died and passed off the scene, but they have successors or others that have risen in their place, and we need to be on guard for that. As Elijah's helpers in the hands of Zerubbabel, we, that is, faithful 100% rod-only Davidians that follow only the original message published by Victor Haddiff, have a part to play to finish the work established by, uh, or by establishing publishing houses worldwide for the original Shepherd's Rod message according to the mandate found in Seven Testimonies to the Church, page 140. The idea that through the, the work of the fourth angel of Revelation 18 will be largely through our publishing houses, plural. This message, the fourth angel of Revelation 18, will join the three angels' message when it's repeated with power and force. Early Writings, page 277. So this is the role that faithful Davidians that follow the original shepherd's rod, they're going to help the Elijah message and continue to publish it and share it worldwide through websites, social media, and the printed track literature. So for more information on this subject, if you have any other questions, comments, or would like to request an outline of the study as a PDF or obtain print copies of the original track literature of the Shepherd's Rod that gives more complete details on this subject and many others, or to arrange for a formal Bible study at your convenience, then please feel free to contact us anytime. Our email, hosea21 at gmail.com, or another email, upa5453 at gmail.com. Our telephone, you can text or call 860-798-3672. A website for a seven-day Adventist to investigate the Shepherd's Rod message, shepherds-rod-speaks.org. And for Davidians confused about who the Elijah messenger was and is today, then we have a website, whyparish.org. Please see those. We thank you for your time, and may God richly bless your search for truth as for hidden treasure. Godspeed.